Proclaim, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill, to your dwelling. And then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the lyre, O God my God. We begin this morning by singing the hymn on the screens, the version of this Psalm 42 and 43. As a deer pants for water, so I long for you, Lord.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Indeed, we praise you, Lord our God, that in our times of gladness, in our times of joy, and also even in times of grief, in times of sadness, we know that your light and your truth will never fail us. They will always lead us to your holy place. They will always lead us to the place where you dwell and to the place that we know that we can meet you in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, the living temple, the one in whom we find all that we need for life, for faith, and for our great hope. And how we delight in his name, the name of Jesus Christ, because in him and, and through him we know you, our Father. We know you truly. We know you intimately. And in him we can rejoice because we know that we belong forever in his gracious hands. We know that whatever the world may throw at us, however we may walk through times of trouble, times of great confusion, even times of real darkness, as we wait in hope for the great day of his appearing, we know that we are kept by his gracious power. And so, Lord, we ask that as we gather again this morning, as your people, this Lord's Day, we pray that you would strengthen our faith again. As we gather in your presence, as we come to you in faith, as you've taught us to do, as we come seeking your face, will you draw near us, we pray. Lift our hearts up to you afresh. And grant us the strength that we need for another week of trusting you, another week of serving you. And we pray that you would give us confidence and joy in doing these things. And so we pray, O oh God, who has prepared for them that love thee such good things as past man's understanding. Pour into our hearts, we pray, such love toward thee that we, loving thee above all things, may obtain thy promises which exceed all that we can desire through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome to all of you uh, this morning. It's great to see you with us. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, then you're very particularly welcome. We hope you'll have a chance to meet you and greet you after the service. And also that you feel very much at home with us here as a, a fellowship of uh, God's people. If you'd like to have a look at these uh, notice sheets, you should have had one on your chair. Uh, you'll find a number of things there. Inside is the uh, prayer update from Sam and Ruth Lee. So do take note of that and use that to help you uh, in your prayers. And uh, inside you'll see um, various notices for this uh, coming week. Down there on the bottom of the first column on Wednesday. Please note there's no lunchtime Bible talk this week. We will be having uh, hosting here uh, the Servants of the Word Conference, the annual conference for uh, ministers, Bible teachers, those in Christian ministry. And uh, we'll all be here Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So uh, there's, no, uh, Bible, uh, there's no Bible talk this week. So please note that. But please also notice that on Wednesday evening, there is our annual meeting. Do come along to that, 7.30 here, as we look back on the year past and give thanks to God and as we share news and look forward to uh, to things coming up in this coming year. So please join us at 7.30 uh, on Wednesday. Back page, uh, one or two other notices there. Uh, a reminder again of the congregational meeting, Servants of the Word. Some congratulations are due. Well, we're delighted for uh, Matt and Nicola that uh, they were rather taken by surprise. A rather early arrival of young Jude James, but glad to say that he's doing well. Uh, it's lovely to see you both here this morning. Congratulations to you. Uh, not so early, rather tardy, but uh, eventually... Simeon James Ritson has also arrived, and so we rejoice with uh, Andy and Cara, and uh, we're very glad uh, for them. Underneath there, you'll see there is a notice about next week. There's the uh, Great Women's Run. This is not to encourage you to be running. Uh, more fool you if you are, but uh, to remind you that if you live in the west of the city, um, that's where the race takes place now. Those of us on the south side <coughs> endured it for about 12 years. We are shouting hallelujah that it's moved west. But um, if you're coming from the West, check the uh, online 
uh, maps and things. Make sure you don't get stuck uh, next Sunday morning. A special welcome uh, this morning uh, to a number of folk. Let me welcome back the Robri family. It's lovely to see you back from Nigeria and uh, all in one piece. We look forward to having you with us over this next uh, six weeks or so. Great to see you all. Welcome. And uh, a special welcome, too, to Simon and Kathy Manchester. Uh, Simon is uh, going to be preaching to us this morning and uh, is going to be joining us in speaking at the Servants of the Word conference this coming week. And uh, it's a great delight to welcome you both back uh, to us. We're glad you're here this time in summer. Last time you came in the dead of winter, and this time you have actually seen the Glasgow sunshine. So uh, we're delighted that you've uh, been able to enjoy that. We look forward to hearing from you soon. And uh, please do be praying for Simon and the rest of us as we take part in the conference this week. Uh, it's an important time and uh, one of real uh, encouragement. Well, we are going to turn to our uh, Bible reading, and we're going to read from Mark chapter 13. If you have one of our Blue Visitors Bibles, you will find that, I think, on page 849. Page 849. And we're going to read together from uh, the beginning of the chapter and then the last couple of paragraphs at the end of the chapter. But perhaps during the offering, you will have time to uh, read through the rest of what goes in between because uh, Simon's going to lead us through the whole chapter a little later on. Mark chapter 13, and Jesus uh, is speaking to his disciples. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not one be left here, not one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to speak to them. Let's move on to number uh, verse 28. And he said, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on your guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the cock crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Amen. And may God bless to us his word. We're going to sing again hymn number six, uh, 864, number 864, which takes up this theme of watching and waiting and working. You servants of the Lord, who for his coming wait, observe with care his heavenly word and be watchful at his gate.
well as the musicians uh, play quietly now and as our offerings are received, you might like, as I suggested, to turn back to Mark chapter 13 and read over the uh, intervening verses. That'll help us uh, when we come uh, to the sermon. And then after we've had the offering, uh, I'm going to ask uh, another visitor who's with us today, David Short, who is in fact Simon's uh, brother-in-law, who is uh, from uh, Australia, but uh, whose church is St. John's Shaughnessy in Vancouver, a church that we have uh, often prayed for, a church which some years ago went through a very, very similar, uh, indeed almost identical uh, transition that we went through, uh, having to leave the uh, Anglican Church uh, in Canada and uh, go through all the things we had to do. David's going to come and uh, I'm taking the opportunity of having him here to uh, have a little word with him and uh, have him bring his encouragement uh, to us. As we uh, listen to music now and read, uh, our offerings will be received. David, welcome to the Tron Church. It's, uh, it's lovely to have you with us uh, here. It's been great you've been able to be here with uh, Simon and uh, your sister Kathy. Welcome to you and Bronwyn. And um, last time uh, we probably had time together was in May 2011. Uh, Richard Henry and I and uh, a couple of others came across to, to visit you in Vancouver because we felt that we were... Um, just about to enter a phase of life which you had become uh, sadly all too familiar with. And uh, indeed, it proved to be uh, an extraordinary helpful time and uh, an extraordinary presci prescient time because all the things you told us about uh, what you went through uh, began to play out with us almost identically in, 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 in very, very similar ways. So it was a sobering time for us, but a very, very helpful time. And I want to just thank you on behalf of the congregation for all the help that you gave to us, because it certainly helped us and the leaders in our church here to, to, to know the way to lead our folk through the coming years. But um, tell us a little about uh, just what we're talking about, and tell us a bit about where you've, uh, where you've come since then. Thank you, William. Uh, it's a great privilege to be with you. Uh, we have prayed for the Tron Church, uh, and uh, I've known Willie for maybe a couple of decades. Um, I bring you greetings from St. John's, Vancouver. As Willie said, uh, we entered into a crisis in our denomination, and although the issue above the water was uh, same-sex marriage, uh, really underneath uh, the water was a different view of God and a different view of Scripture, a different view of the gospel, a different view of repentance, a different view of the Christian life. 
and this was the last of a number of issues and when we took a stand on it, uh, charges were brought against us. And we entered nearly a decade of conflict in our denomination, which you probably might have seen some of in this country, uh, in the Church of England around the world. And uh, we rejoice in the fellowship that we've had with like-minded brothers and sisters in other Christian churches who've made expensive and costly decisions based on the understanding of the biblical faith and how glad we are uh, for Will William's leadership and for the leaders who came with us. It was a great encouragement to us as well to see this happening not only in our own church but in churches uh, outside the Anglican Church. So I want to encourage you um, and say now push on, uh, put that behind you because uh, it's easy, it was, has been easy for us to look back and lick our wounds and say what now, what now but uh, there is a great sense in which God is doing something different with us as we look out in a different context. And I don't think it's easy for us to reach out with the gospel uh, in uh, our current Western culture. So uh, 12 years, we lost everything. We lost our church like you did. We don't have a building to move to. We are renting in a Seventh-day Adventist building. We praise God for the Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> A different understanding of the Sabbath. They use it on Saturdays. We use it Sunday and during the week. Um, and uh, we've, uh, the Lord is bringing people to us. Uh, we are not seeing many uh, normal, uh, traditional Canadians come to faith in Christ. The Lord is bringing to us uh, people who have immigrated to Canada, for which we're very grateful. Mm. It's great to hear that... Uh like us, you've moved on, uh, you're not looking back, you're uh, looking to the future and so on. But there are still um, uh, the same sort of things happening across the, the Anglican church, particularly in the Western world. You're still involved with that uh, and you're, tell us wh where you're going soon and, and, and what's going on with the, 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 the sort of GAFCON thing. Would you like a lesson in Anglican church politics? <laughs> we love it because it's nothing to do with us, so we don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to talk about our own, but uh, we'll talk about yours. Well, uh, in the Anglican Church, we have, a, we have this sense of being a global communion. And right from the start, international bishops, archbishops, and, and uh, country leaders uh, stood with us. So the Anglican Church is in 32 countries with a membership of some, something like 80 million and about 70-something million stand for the gospel. It's the churches in England, Scotland, uh, Australia, Canada, the United States, in the West, in the wealthy West, that have been very infected by what's called theological liberalism, which means we treat the Bible as a record of what people have said in the past, rather than the word of God come down through us through the apostles and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a divide in the Anglican communion. And uh, the old structures of the Archbishop of Canterbury and uh, the very England-centred structures are now really a thing of the past. They've proved inadequate for the mission of the church in the 21st century. They've also proved structures can uh, be an expression of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, but they have become a barrier and a way in which uh, godly Christians are persecuted in the West. So there is now a global sense of urgency about this. And uh, in a week's time, we go down to Jerusalem for the third meeting of GAFCON, the Global Anglican Fellowship, uh, Futures Conference. And this represents uh, the 70 million Anglicans worldwide and their intent on proclamation of the gospel, biblical literacy, faithfulness in mission, uh, seeking to serve the poor in Africa, and uh, structures of unity. So it's, it's, it's a very wild and exciting time to be an Anglican. And David, what can we pray for you and for the church uh, in Vancouver at this time? Thank you. Uh, would you pray that the Lord would give us a building in his timing? and that we continue to be faithful, reaching out with the gospel. We'd love to see a harvest amongst uh, traditional Canadians as well as amongst immigrants. And uh, we've been thinking and praying toward this 
for just about a year or two now. Um, and there's a sense of lightness that God has taken away, or God has seen fit to continue with us, but we don't have resources. So pray that the Lord would give us a uh, harvest and a home. We will do. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's lovely to have you with us. Thank you. Well, let's, uh, let's pray together now, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the real truth of real Christian fellowship all around this world, that wherever you go in this world, east or west, there are brothers and sisters in Christ who love you, who serve you, who are committed to your gospel, and who cherish your word as truth and light. And we thank you so much for David and for the church at, at St. John's Vancouver for the, the light and the testimony and the witness that they have been, not only in their own nation, not only in the Anglican communion around the world, but to many others in other groupings and denominations like our own. The inspiration that, that they have been by their stand, their courageous stand, and we thank you, Lord, for the way that you have led them through that and blessed them and are continuing to bless them as they stand for your unchanging gospel, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We do pray, Lord, that you would grant their eyes to see a great harvest for your kingdom in that cosmopolitan city of Vancouver. Thank you that many from all parts of the world are coming there and are finding Christ just as we are seeing here in our own city. But we pray also for the native Canadians, just as we pray for our own fellow Scots here who have had so much for so long and therefore find it easy to treat all that they have received with disdain and as of little value. We Pray, Lord, for the power of your Holy Spirit to be at work through the great gospel of our Lord Jesus in the city of Vancouver and through the ministry of St. John's. And we pray also, Lord, that you would, in your good time, give them not just a home, but the right home, a, a wonderful home, a place that they will be able to use as a platform for gospel ministry of many different kinds. It's been a great thrill, Lord, to our hearts over these past years to hear of other fellowships like our own who have been homeless for a time and then you have provided them, very often with something far better than ever they imagined, better than ever they had before. And we know that you are the God in whose hands are all things. And we know that you have just the right place for them in your good timing. And we pray that there would come a time when we are rejoicing with them that they found a new place from which to base their ministry. We pray, Lord, for the upcoming GAFCON conference in Jerusalem where those from churches right across the world and especially from the Commonwealth would gather and encourage one another in the truth that is in Jesus. We pray especially for those coming from the Western nations where the denominations like the Church of England and others have become so wayward, so uh, corrupted, and so careless of your word of truth. We pray for some, Lord, who likewise have suffered and are suffering loss and great hatred because of their stand for you. And we pray that that great gathering with so many from around the world will be one of great encouragement to them very particularly. We pray for the leaders that as they Seek the way forward for these many churches, that you would inspire them, give them wisdom and insight, and give them great leadership under you, that this vast body of believers throughout the world would be wisely and well-led for the sake not only of their own associations and denominations in their countries, but for the strength of your true church all around the world. We know, Lord, that in these last days, as you yourself told us, as the apostles affirmed, there would be terrible times, much deception, many to lead astray, many false Christs and false prophets, 
perverting the minds, even of those who profess to follow you and love you. But we pray, Father, that your church would be strong in the midst of all of these things, that as we bear witness in a world that is shrouded in darkness, you would give us confidence, clarity, and real commitment to the unchanging gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, hear us, we pray, and minister to our own hearts also this morning as we come to these words of our Lord and Savior. May they indeed bring light and truth to lead us in your way, to lead us in your truth, to lead us to work as your servants until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. Give us courage and give us encouragement, we ask, that we might be the better servants and soldiers of our Lord Jesus Christ and that his name might be known through us in this city that we love. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Simon comes to preach us then, we sing together our version of the Lord's Prayer on the screens. Our Father God, who dwells in heaven, draw near to hear your children. Good morning, dear friends. Thank you for your welcome. And let's bow our heads.
Our Heavenly Father, we ask that as we turn to the Scriptures, that in our weakness you would give us strength, in our foolishness that you would give us wisdom, in our dullness that you would give quickening, and we pray, Heavenly Father, for the, the dear people who are gathered this morning, that they would not just hear a voice, but in your word they would hear your voice. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's very good of you to have two Australians in the service in one morning. Uh, you truly are a godly people to have such riffraff come and be with you. And uh, it's a very special day in the Philip home because it's a key birthday for Rebecca. And I was thinking in honour that I probably... <laughs> I was thinking I should preach on Psalm 21 as a special reference to her birthday. But I've taken Mark chapter 13. So um, if you've got Mark chapter 13, this is a wonderful gift to us, this chapter, because what Jesus gives us in the chapter is a telescope that looks forward in the short term and the long term. And because we're very short-sighted by nature, we are, we are just short-sighted people. We think about things like the weekend and the week that is coming and a job that has to be done and a trip that we're going to take and our horizon is very limited but here in this wonderful chapter Jesus gives us a telescope which looks down the road to something which is fairly immediate and then looks down to something which is ultimate and what Jesus does in this chapter as many of you know is he predicts the the, the time that the city of Jerusalem will be invaded, and it was, and then he predicts the time where the world will be invaded by him, and it will be invaded. So I thought we might try and get a handle on the whole chapter by looking at under three headings this morning, uh, that first of all, Jesus is our security, and we'll see why. Secondly, that he is our authority, and we'll see why. And thirdly, he is our priority, and we will see why. So, security, authority, priority, S-A-P, sap, as in a tree. When I bump into you after the service and say, can you remember anything of the sermon? There may be one or two of you who will say, security, authority, priority. That's the plan. So, first of all, Jesus is our security, chapter 13 of Mark, verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple... One of his disciples said, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And Jesus said, they will all be pushed over. Notice he says, or notice we read in verse 1, that he leaves the temple. This is a highly significant phrase. He never goes back to the temple. He is finished with the temple. The temple is no longer part of God's plans. That Old Testament temple is no longer part of God's plans for two reasons. One, it has failed. It's failed in its mission. It was meant to be an instrument of truth and mercy and an arrow to the Messiah. And it was doing none of those things. It's failed. You remember that the temple was attacked by Jesus, turning the tables. You remember that the people in the temple attacked him with their hard questions. The temple has failed. Second, it's finished its job. All the sacrifices of the Old Testament, as you know, were a warm-up to the great sacrifice of Christ on the cross, and Jesus now wants people to look away from the old temple to him. But it was a great building. We're told that it covered many football fields and that some of the stones that have been discovered or recovered were five yards by five yards by ten yards. No wonder the disciples said it's magnificent. And they were shocked when Jesus said it would be pushed over. And it was violently pushed over. We're told that when the Roman troops came in, they attacked the building with a frenzy. And you can imagine the disciples thinking to themselves, well, last time the temple was destroyed, we went off as prisoners to Babylon, so what are we talking about? But you don't need the temple, says Jesus, the old temple, you need him. This is very comforting, because uh, we're all going to leave this particular room, 
or the room downstairs or we're going to walk home or get in our cars. And the point Jesus is making is that if you go home with him, because you've put your trust in him and you belong to him, you have everything. Our mother-in-law, my mother-in-law has just passed away at the age of 92, nearly 93. And it's been a very lovely thing to see this godly woman basically peacefully farewell everything in this world and go with Jesus out of the world. We actually just watched this process of him looking after her and her going to meet him. So it's a very comforting thing. If you have Jesus, forget about the building. But it's also very challenging because if you have building or religion but not Jesus, you are really of all to be most pitied. You know, if you only know the building and you know the minister and you know the coffee and you know the hymns, but you don't actually know Jesus Christ, he's a stranger to you and you are to him. Well, of course, you're in a tragic position. And uh, not long ago, I talked to a lady in the church who'd been in some particular church for 75 years and had no clue what it was to be a Christian. Not a clue. She'd sung every hymn. She'd sung Amazing Grace. She'd sung And Can It Be. She'd heard the sermons. Every visiting evangelist, nothing had connected. So Jesus says the temple is finished. It will soon be destroyed. And the disciples ask in verse 4, verse four when and what will be the sign? Now, before Jesus answers the question, he tells them what he thinks is important. They think the destruction of the building is important. He says, let me tell you what is important. And the first thing he says, verse 5, this is typical of Jesus, and this is so instructive for us. He says, watch out that no one deceives you, that nobody comes in my name and deceives you, meaning takes you away from me. So Jesus says to the disciples, you're worried about the building, I'm worried that you'll lose me. Now, my friends, do people get tricked away from Jesus? They do. You'll know many people, sadly, who have walked with Jesus or seem to walk with Jesus and have gone on a journey away. And that's why so many of the New Testament letters, uh, like Hebrews, are saying, don't leave Jesus for the temple. Or 1 Corinthians, don't leave Jesus for some superstar pastor. Or Colossians, don't leave Jesus for some mystical philosopher. Or Galatians, don't leave Jesus for some legalist. People do, don't they? And those who've grown up in the world with um, the foundation of Jesus and have yet turned to Mary, what a tragedy. Or to Muhammad, what a tragedy. So Jesus says, first, make sure your soul is safe. Second, he says, verse 7, make sure your mind is clear. When you hear of wars, rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. This has got nothing, says Jesus, to do with the second coming. Such things must happen. The end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquake, famine. These are the beginning of birth pangs. You've got to have a clear mind. So when you're watching the news and you see that uh, the possibility of a war, which is very alarming or an earthquake has taken place which is very distressing, or a famine which is very distressing. You have to say to yourself as you watch or hear, this is not the end of the world. This is the world. This is the normal world that we live in. Jesus says, verse 7, the end is not yet. Have a clear mind. Thirdly, your strength will be given to you Verse 9, because when, you are on your, when you're arrested, especially to the first century disciples, and you're taken to synagogues or local councils, and you stand before governors and kings, and you give witness, the gospel is your first priority, verse 10. And when you're arrested and brought to trial, don't worry beforehand about what you'll say, just say what's given, because it will not be you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. You'll be given your strength. When you are arrested, says Jesus to his disciples, don't think to yourself, gee, I've been deserted by God at this point. No, he will be with you in that particular context and will help you to know what to say. And there must have been many occasions where Jesus himself went on under his trials and said exactly what was appropriate. And then the apostles found themselves being arrested and also were given the right words to say. We see it so much in the book of Acts, don't we? 
Notice that the gospel is the priority, verse 10. The gospel must first be preached. I don't think he's saying in this verse the gospel must be preached to everyone before Christ can come. Undoubtedly, God would love every person to hear the gospel, but I don't think in the context Jesus is saying the gospel must be preached before Christ can come. I think in the context he's saying when you're in the courtroom, it's the gospel first. That's your priority. It's not your skin, it's not your success, it's not your case, it's the gospel. There's your opportunity. And then Jesus says, fourthly, your heart is with Christ. Your family may desert you. Unbelievable, isn't it, that a child would betray a parent? Imagine a child ringing up the authorities and saying, I'm just telling you that my parents are Christians. Or a parent rings up and says, I'm just letting you know that my children have become Christians. A terrible betrayal. And everyone says, Jesus may hate you, but stand firm. So Jesus is our security. It's not the temple, it's Jesus. And he wants our soul to be safe, our mind to be clear, our strength to be given, and our heart to be with him. Second, he's our authority. Look at chapter 13, verse 14. He begins to talk about the events which will take place just down the track and the invasion of Jerusalem. And he shows himself to be a great, great authority because the city was invaded in AD 70 and the prediction came true as Jesus said. Last week I was preaching at a church and um, a friendly Scotsman came up and told me, I think he was making a comment on the famous frugality of the Scots. He said that if in my visit to Scotland I go to the Highlands, he said if it gets very cold, laddie, in the Highlands, uh, the men will gather around a candle. And he said if it gets very, very cold, they'll light it. (laughs) Which I thought was quite cute. And I think what he was saying was, I have some information for you, and if you pursue it, you may discover, well, of course, he's talking fiction. But here Jesus is talking non-fiction. He says in chapter 13, verse 14, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, then let those who are in Judea run for the hills. So he's answering their question, what will be the sign of the fall of the temple? And he says in verse 14, it will be an evil sign. There will be an abomination that causes desolation, or one translation says there'll be a monster that causes chaos, or we might say there'll be great evil that will bring emptiness to the place. Uh, This phrase, abomination that causes desolation, is a quote from the Old Testament from the book of Daniel chapter 12. And it's where Daniel predicted an abomination in the temple which took place because the Greeks came in in about 168 BC and they blasphemed the temple. They set up a pig on the altar and they basically began to worship Zeus. And this was a great abomination, a great fist, so to speak, in the face of Yahweh. And Jesus now borrows the quote, abomination that causes desolation, and he says there'll be another abomination that causes desolation in the temple. And he spoke the truth because just a few decades down the track, in came the Romans, slaughtered many and stacked corpses around the altar in the temple. So Jesus spoke the truth. Now, in case you think those two events, one in the Old Testament, one in the, new, one in the early decades of the AD, are all ancient history, we're told in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the devil is always in the business of replacing the glory of God with something evil. And we could talk for hours about the thousands of ways the devil organizes something that is idolatrous and evil to stand in the place of God's glory. 
Well, what wisdom does Jesus give his disciples when this abomination takes place? Verse 14, he says, run for the hills. Forget about your coat, forget about your possessions, run for the hills, get out of the city. And what Jesus said came true, the Roman forces came in, the Christians fled the city, they had listened to Jesus. When this took place, they left the city. But many of the Jews who'd rejected the Messiah stayed and they were killed in great numbers. They paid a very heavy price at turning their back on the Messiah. I think that's why Jesus says in verse 19 that the distress will be the worst, will be unequaled and unparalleled because I think this is the worst experience that Jerusalem ever went through. I think he's talking about what took place in Jerusalem. Now, let me remind you this morning that uh, what took place in Jerusalem was not taking place to a city that was innocent or sweet. This was a city that had turned its back on the Messiah. Jesus had come into the city, he'd visited, he'd healed, he'd taught, he'd loved, he'd invited, he'd pleaded, he'd wept, and they took him outside the city and they crucified him outside. So there is nothing left for the city but death. They've turned their back on the gift of life and they received, even in the short term, if not in the long term, a very terrible death. Well, you notice how lovingly Jesus warns, which of course, that's what love does, love warns. The world says to the church, please don't interfere, don't say anything that would interfere. Put your warnings away, we hate your warnings. Just say that we can do whatever we want and there'll be no consequences. That's exactly what is said in the garden in Genesis 3, isn't it? You can have everything and there'll be no consequences. And that's what the world loves from the church. But love speaks the truth. And love says to people, you're in great danger. You need to turn. You need to get safe. You need to turn from your sin. You need to drop your sin. You need to get quickly to Christ. You need to, to turn to him and to run to him. That's what Jesus does here. So he urges and he pleads, and then he says in verse 20 that God will cut short the suffering, and so in some remarkable way, God must have cut short the suffering. And then he, Jesus goes on in verse 21 to say, and remember the deceivers, those people who will come along when things are terrible and tell you they've got some simple, quick answer solution. Watch out for those people. So Jesus is our authority. And since he got the first prediction right, as he put the telescope out, um, he will get the second prediction right as he puts the telescope right out to his return. That's why in verse 24 he says, in those days, those final days, the end of the world is going to be very different. The end of the world is going to be a cosmic experience. We're not talking about grabbing your coat or coming down off the roof or quickly scooping up your possessions. We're talking about the change of the cosmos. We're talking about sun, moon, and stars and the coming of the Son of Man so that everybody in the whole world will see him. He won't be coming in the Sydney Heads or coming to New York or to Glasgow. He'll be seen by the whole world. And as we know from Jesus, it will be him, personal, global, it will be wonderful. Jesus says in Luke 21, the believer will lift up his head or her head and say, my salvation, my redemption is coming. It will be terrible for the person who has rejected Christ. It will be terrible, terrible. And Jesus says it's predicted because he's told us, but it's going to be unexpected like, like a thief in the night. So he left in the clouds, Acts 1, he ascended to the throne in the clouds, and he's going to come, verse 26, in the clouds. Now, my friends, we didn't see the fall of Jerusalem. Nobody here saw the fall of Jerusalem. We may not see the second coming. Oh, it would be wonderful to see the second coming. I would love to be part of that generation that will see the second coming, and one generation will see the second coming. But even if we didn't see the fall of Jerusalem and we don't see the coming of Jesus, 
we know he said the, the first rightly, and we know he speaks the second truthfully. And therefore, we live between the two. Thankful that he kept his promise, and thankful that he will keep his promise. He's our authority. That's why he says in verse 23, be on your guard, I have told you. And then thirdly this morning, Jesus is our priority. He's our security, not the, the, not the old temple, but him. He's our authority, keeps his promises. Thirdly, he's our priority. And what I love about this whole chapter is that Jesus obviously intervenes for our welfare. Do you know that sort of person who breaks in to prevent you from going down the wrong road, taking the wrong turn, making the wrong move? That person who intervenes because they love you, that's what Jesus does. He intervenes, he interrupts. And he's pleading in the chapter, I want you to be ready. I don't want you to be deceived. I don't want you to be lost. I want you to be saved. And not only does he plead for our security, but he bleeds for our security so that we might be saved. Well, in the little paragraph from verse 28, which we had read for us, he goes back to the question of the first century disciples getting ready for the local invasion. And look at what he says in verse 28. Learn this lesson from the fig tree. As its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know summer is near. Now, we understand this principle, don't we? We know when summer has come, your days get very long, certain fruits come back to the shop, uh, pale Scottish skin begins to appear from underclothes, and uh, in Australia, the sound of mowers every week, mowing the lawn, uh, is heard. The sounds and the sights and the signs of summer. But um, Jesus says in the same way, verse 29, when these things happen, and he's talking about the collapse of the temple and the arrival of the abomination, you know, he says, the enemy is at the door. You ask me, says Jesus, verse 4, about these things. Well, verse 29, I'm telling you about these things. And the attack came, exactly as he said, and it came before that generation passed away. That's why Jesus says, these things to do with this first fall will take place before this generation passes away. Very important to notice this. Many people have jumped on the verse before this generation and said, oh, Jesus obviously made a mistake here. He was thinking, you know, that he would return before the end of the generation, but he's obviously got things wrong. We must have pity upon Jesus. No, he says, you've been talking about these things. These things will happen before this generation. And then he changes the topic in verse 32 and says, but about that day, well, that's a different matter. Now, Jesus was a great truth teller. That's why we're so grateful for him. He said to one man who'd come with a servant sick back home, if you walk home, you'll find him well. And the man walked home and found Jesus well, but found the servant well. And then Jesus said to the disciples on one occasion, let's go round to Bethany and we'll raise Lazarus. And they went and they raised. And then he said to uh, the disciples, if you go round the corner, you'll find a donkey tied to a fence. And if you untie it, they'll say this and you say this and bring it and I'll ride it to Jerusalem. And that's what happened. And he said to them, if you follow this man, who's carrying a water jar, he'll go up to an upper room, and that's where we'll have the Last Supper. And that's what they found, and that's what they did. And he said to Judas, you'll betray me, and he did. And he said to Peter, you'll deny me, and Peter said, I won't. And Jesus said, you will, and he did. And Jesus said, I'll be arrested, and he was, and crucified, and he was, and ra raised, and he was. And he said, the Spirit will come, and he did. And he said, Jerusalem will fall, and it did. And there'll be troubles for believers, and there were, and he'll return, and he will. This tremendous succession of promises and fulfillments, which is why, of course, we can take seriously verse 31. Heaven and earth will pass away. My word, says Jesus, will never pass away. Now, verse 32, about that day, 
Jesus says, I don't have a date for you. I do not have a date for you. No angel has a date for you. And friends, you can be sure no preacher has a date and no paperback has a date and no dreamer has a date. And Jesus says he himself doesn't have a date, only the Father. So he submits himself in a wonderful way to the knowledge of the Father on this detail. As somebody has said, he's ignorant about this issue, but he's not ignorant of his ignorance. And therefore, he speaks with authority on what he knows and this detail that he knows he doesn't know. Well, what does Jesus want us to do as we wait? This is what appears in verses 32 to 37. And this promise of no date has done good for the church, hasn't it? Because the church for 2,000 years, not knowing the date of Jesus' return, has been kept expectant, praying, waiting, watching, sacrificing, gospeling, rejoicing, expecting. It's done us good. It's very, very shrewd to not be told the date. Every generation in every country has been kept expectant. But what does Jesus expect us to do? Basically, you can bring it down to two words in verses 32 to 37. He expects us to watch and to work. Watch, he says, because it's a spiritual battle right up until the second coming. And work, he says, because there are things for every believer to do. Every believer is to watch and to work. And therefore, we've got to say to ourselves when we get up in the morning that we're servants, we've got a task. And although the day may look pretty dull to us, it is actually a very, very important day in God's purposes. And so we say to ourselves as we wake up in the morning, if possible, I'm going into a battleground, not a playground. I must be watchful. And there are opportunities for me to pray, think, say, not speak, speak answer and I am looking to be useful we don't say as we get up in the morning as the world does I'm an independent agent and I own my life and my life is my business no we say as we get up we've been saved by the Lord Jesus he made us he saved us he owns us he's one day going to assess us and therefore we are seeking to be useful don't say as some of you may be tempted, I think my life is pretty useless. That's impossible. The prayer, the word, the letter, the email, those little things are used by God for great, great lasting good. And if he has called you, you don't need great muscles to be useful. You don't need great brilliance to be useful. You just need to be willing. One of the most useful people in our church back home is a quadriplegic lady in her wheelchair. She preaches a thousand sermons to us by her godly life. Her trust, her witness, her sweetness, her wisdom, it is a blessing to us. And so the Lord is able to use you. Don't forget that the word watch and work are not just imperatives, but are also indicatives in that Jesus did them before us. He watched to the end. That's why we're secure. He worked to the cross. That's why we're secure. He's not asking us to watch and work so we'll be secure. He watched and worked to make us secure. He asks us to watch and work in order to be useful. So don't take your lead from television commercials, which are very self-centered and rubbish. Don't live your life during the week in such a way that you confuse your fellow workers and they look at you and say, I hear he's a Christian. Unbelievable. Don't confuse your fellow workers. Live by the grace of God as consistently as you can. Don't be a spectator in your church. Don't come like a sponge, but say to yourself, I'm watching and I'm working even when I come to the local church. There is a role for me to play. And I hope you might, with me, get into the habit every morning of waking up and saying, I'm walking into an opportunity as well as some challenges 
and I'm asking the Lord to overrule all things for my godliness and for his glory. So Jesus is our security. He's the true temple. If you have him, you have your security. He's our authority. He keeps his promises and he will keep this great promise of a return. And he's our priority because as we live in the world, we're seeking to watch and to work. I want to just close by reading you a little letter that I received a week or so ago. A lady wrote to me, most of the letters I get are crabby, so feel free to write a lovely letter to me anytime. But this letter came from a sweet lady, I don't really know her, and she said this. She said, this is a long overdue letter. I wanted to tell you that uh, my most difficult child who came to your church and would not speak to anybody, uh, I met you one night and you took down his details and you contacted him and you took him out to coffee and you befriended him and you gave him a book and this has changed his life. I pause at this point to say to you, I don't remember this at all and I'm incapable of being useful to anybody. But then she says this, he has moved to Bondi, he has joined a church, he has been baptized, he has married a Christian lass, he is raising a godly family. We are encouraged. Thank you. Is that not a remarkable piece of feedback on something we do which we don't remember doing and are incapable of doing properly? And that's what you do, dear friends. You pray for somebody, you meet with them, you sit and have coffee with them, you give them something, you move off wondering whether any good has taken place and God in his wisdom uses our frail efforts for long-lasting good. So remember, Jesus is our security, our authority, and our priority. Let's thank him and ask him to help us. Let's bow our heads. Our gracious God, we thank you for this wonderful chapter. We thank you for the beauty of the Lord Jesus and the way he taught so thoughtfully, wisely, wonderfully, and clearly. We thank you that we find our security in him, and having him, we have great, great security. We thank you, too, that he is our authority, that his promises can be stood on forever. And we thank you, too, that he is our priority, and we ask that in the midst of this very sad and needy world, you would use us, even us, as we watch and work. Please take and use us, even this day, to be useful in your purposes. And we ask that you would bear much fruit, fruit that lasts through us to your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Simon. We're going to sing as we close number 940. Number 940, this hymn of Charles Wesley that picks up this same theme. Let's look at verse 4. Help me to bear your easy yoke, and every moment watch and pray, and still to things eternal look, and hasten to that glorious day. Gladly for you may I employ all that your generous grace has given, and run my course with constant joy and closely walk with you to heaven. Number 940.
Let's pray together. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, that in our Lord Jesus we do indeed have security, both now and for all the future. We have from his lips with great authority a true revelation of all that will be, and that we have above all in him our great priority in life. Help us, Lord, for it to be that way always, not just today, not just every day of this week, but all the days of our lives. And so to that end, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.